All right. All right. Starting from my my left, your right. Um, give us a little bit of background about yourself. About thirty seconds. <coughs> All right. I graduated Camden High in '48. Was drafted '50, November 1950. Took eight weeks of pace to Fort Dix. Went over and sent me to Korea. Put me in a heavy weapons platoon, a part of a machine gun, a 75 recoilless, the AR, all the heavy weapons. My MOS was machine gun, a heavy part of machine gun, basically. Uh, it took about nine months before they finally got me. High school 50. I was wounded in November of 1951. We'll get into that. <coughs> uh, I went in service when I was 17. I was, took my basic in Fort Dix. I went to Fort Lewis. Second Division, I hit Korea in August of 1950. <coughs> in Korea, I was on 57 recoilless rifle, machine gun, flamethrower, and rifleman. And what weapon were you most off the Machine gun. Machine gun. I might come in machine Was that the 30 cal like Mr. Jones had? 30. <coughs> the 30 cal. 30 cal machine gun. I, was, I ended up <coughs> And don't forget, you were from where? You're a South Jersey guy. <coughs> That's from most days. You're a little town in Voorhees. Right. Okay. I grew up in West Philadelphia. I would not want to live there today. And I was drafted at the age of 20. Uh, I served 16 weeks. I trained with the 101st Airborne Division. <clears throat> Pardon me, I trained with every infantry weapon on, up, including the flamethrower. But my basic weapon was a Browning automatic rifle. And when I was sent overseas uh, during the last Chinese Communist offensive, uh, when I arrived in Korea, they sort of took away my rifle and gave me pencils and a 45 caliber pistol. I was sent to a, an unstructured hospital mm -hmm. closer towards the lines, and I saw a lot of severely wounded. So you're familiar with the mass units, correct? But there yeah. was no humor where I was. Yes, I quite that. familiar. And your name is? Stanley Levin. Okay. My name is Ike Hand. I went to Morristown Friends School. I started at Temple University in one evening in the night school. A bunch of us decided school wasn't for us. What do you want to do? We went down and enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Three days later, we were down at Paris Island, and some one drill instructor said to the other, what can you do with these guys? The other drill instructor said, anything you want, you just can't kill them. <laughs> and uh, what was your MOS, sir? Were you infantry? Oh, 300, infantry, yes. Oh, 300. And you got to Korea about what time? What, what, what? 51. 51? Yeah, the 11th replacement draft. Start with yeah. your name first. My name is Carl Atesia. I joined the Navy at 17 of June 1950. The Korean War broke out in 1950, graduated boot camp, got assigned to the Corbin School, which is known as the Medics. I come out of the Corbin School, I got assigned to USS Midway aircraft carrier. I got tired of being the nurse for the carrier, I joined the Marines. I was half Navy and half Marines. And my job in Korea was to save lives, not to take lives, but I had the means to take a life. Okay, so you carried a 45? I carried a 45 and a carbine. So your story is not unlike uh, Bradley, who was the uh, one of the flag raisers at uh, Iwo Jima, is that correct? Yeah, you same thing. I was at Corman, Corman. Corman with the Marine Corps. It was all Navy mm -hmm. supplies the Marines with Don't call him Corman. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, going back, uh, everyone who, and just for the record, uh, re restate your name when we go through this again. When, when you talk to Korean War veterans, one of the things they're always going to remember is the weather, the fluctuation of the weather and the hazardous of the weather. Why don't you just spend a little bit of time talking about that? And then, go ahead. Judge. Judge, I experienced <coughs> the summer and the winter. Uh, as I was in April 51. Mm -hmm. And the summer was nothing but monsoon. It rained for two or three months. Small as I was, I had a platoon on and uh, poncho on. <laughs> it was always wet. And it was very hot. <coughs> Anyone else? The, ri the rice paddies were yeah. fertilized with human waste, and that odor never left your nostrils. Yeah. In fact, three to five miles from the ship en route to Korea, mm -hmm. we looked at each other, what's that smell? Yeah. We had no idea. Well, that's yeah. one of the unfortunate mm -hmm. things. Honey buckets. Uh, we yeah. called it honey. Yeah, the honey carts. Yeah. Once you get that smell, that old, you, you can just visualize them rice paddies going up the side of the mountain. Uh, it's, it's talking yeah. about the monsoons, uh, when you come off the front lines, you work with the engineers throwing uh, rocks and stuff and holes along the road and troops that get, mm -hmm. to get your vehicles through. And we used uh, prisoners of 
pick up the rocks. <coughs> One of my jobs was to carry the BAR, and uh, we taped the uh, firing pins of the 30 caliber machine guns out under our arms because it was so cold. If we didn't, they'd crack and jam the guns. So we covered the field of fire with the BARs till they got the 30 calibers going. And it was quite tricky. It was cold, really, really cold. So you're relying on the warmth of underneath the arm? That's correct. 60 yeah. Pounds. yeah. Now and the BAR fired 20 rounds, is that it? Yeah, magazine of 20 rounds. Fully and one, one interesting thing was when the Chinese came, they wouldn't fight with it less than 20 to 1. And one time they were coming up the mountain, and we looked down at the fellow next to me, he said, don't shoot the first one, he's a kid. And when he came up, we grabbed the kid, took the stick out of his hand, spanked him and sent him home. Okay, go on home, sonny, your mother's calling you. And everybody started laughing. We could hardly fight for the laughter. You spared the guy, right? he, No, we couldn't kill him. The Not kidding. The fired 600 rounds a minute, and you don't dare touch that barrel. That's how hot it got. You never get your hand off of it. Now, the same round that was in a BAR was also in the M1, right? You want 30 so caliber. Right yeah, yeah uh, again, my job was to save lives. Uh, when a Marine gets wounded, the first, team, first 15 minutes decide if he's going to live or die. My job was get to that Marine, no matter what the conditions were. When you heard Corman, Doc, whatever, you knew someone was hit. No matter what the conditions were, my job was to get to that Marine and stop the bleeding, give him a shot of morphine, get him stable, and get him out of there. All and this I, while you were under fire? Well, at times, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Now, um, we were staying with the cold just a little bit with you. In the colder weather, would the uh, would the bleeding be uh, yeah, colder? Colder weather, the the uh, blood would calculate with the cold weather. I was there summer, and all I remember is being soaking wet for three days, like I fell in a lake. Uh, yeah. In the winter time, the corpsmen would put morphine in their mouths to keep it from freezing, and uh, morphine was the most important thing to get to a wound and stop mm -hmm. the pain. One of our chapter members sure. was supposed to be here, Fred Connolly. Yes. Was bayoneted yeah, through the neck. He didn't bleed to death because of the cold. Froze yeah, right so up. cold. Yeah. I actually had interviewed Mr. Connolly. Oh, you know Tremendous story. And he was there earlier than you guys were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, he actually was in uh, Fall yeah, Hill. Yeah, yeah, also right. in Chuck. Yeah, I, I, I remember his story. It was a very, very poignant story. He had a famous yeah. picture taken of himself, too, when, when he was in another uniform. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, going along with this, um, <coughs> one, of, one of the things I, I, I think that we would <coughs> like you to <coughs> share is like, I, I, here you are, and um, you know, right after World War II, and America was basically, you know, we thought we were going to have some period of peace, and next thing you know, you're in a war again. And um, how did that feel, being young like you were, and sent overseas, and and here you are in another war, and we thought World War II was going to end it all. I mean, how did that make you feel? We grew up in a very patriotic era. Yeah. I remember all the males disappeared from the streets during World War II. Everybody disappeared. They went to service. So we were accustomed to that, and when the Korean War broke out, we anticipated and knew we would eventually be drafted. And none of us it never would have entered our mind to not go forward. And, and, uh, mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, good. Uh, you're talking about males all the street. Everybody's parents, both people were working, your mother and father. You, you learned to cook at home, mm -hmm. do work at home. Mm -hmm. I appreciated life more because I've seen so many bodies mangled and deaf, mm -hmm. and I look forward to a good dish of spaghetti my <laughs> grandmother made. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, true. That's the truth. Yep. I, I was trying to capture, if I could, the mood you were about being thrust into the middle of a war zone like that. And here you were, almost like a, a fish yanked out of a pond. H how was that when you got there and all of a sudden there was a war all the way around? You were scared. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I was scared. You yeah. say you weren't scared, you lied. Yeah. Everyone I, was scared. Mm -hmm. We were scared on the ship going over. No. We got there. Yeah. I have something very ahead, vivid sir. memory. Go ahead, Mr. Miller. Go ahead. When we were on the ship going at Stanley Levin, on the ship in mid ocean, we were all gung ho, boy. We were highly trained infantry, and let's get them. And the ship was so noisy, there were 3,700 men stepped on the ship. And all of a sudden, this giant white ship passed us maybe three miles off with red crosses and when it going in the opposite direction and the ship grew absolutely silent mm -hmm. because we knew what was on that oh, ship. Wounded guys. Dead oh, wounded. Wounded, yeah, yeah. I'll never forget that. Story. Yeah. Before I move on to the next question, anybody else want to address that? Okay, now um, everyone has two, three, four memories that are going to stay with them forever. And um, I would like you to think about the question and say, okay, if I was to say to you, what was like 
what, what's a memory that is maybe painful or maybe just stands out that's going to stay with you forever? First day. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, Mr. I Adolf, first got it. Mr. Adolf, first day in combat. You do your first person kill. Mm -hmm. I only knew the guy three weeks, and you knew him well. And we had we had our first two killed. Him and we had a Marine went all through the Pacific, came in the Army. He was our mortar squad. He was number two man. Mm -hmm. It's been on my mind a long time. Is that yeah. artillery fire? Excuse me? Artillery? No. How was Small he? arms. Small arms fire? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and you saw that, and how did it affect you? What was going through your mind? It didn't affect me until uh, after everything quieted down. And then I started thinking, that could have been me. We're laying side by side or mm -hmm. in a row. That could have been me. Yeah, he, the, the, his name was Shep, and he was from Alabama. And there yeah. you go. He makes it through World War II only to... to yeah, that's... That, yeah, that My first day in combat, a young fellow named John Eisenhardt, who lived in Pittman, we are walking along, and he happened to step off the path, stepped on mine, and blew him to pieces. Well, that was on my mind forever. And, ever and how close were you to that, Mr. Jim? Right next to him. Right next to him. I remember the uh, <coughs> first wound that I attend to. Uh, the Marines were on a patrol. I was in a, I was well protected. Uh, the point man stepped on a landmine, big explosion. Myself, another Marine, ran up to him. His left leg was missing. The other leg was mangled. Uh, he had no pain at the time. I tried to stop the bleed as best I can. I gave him a shot of morphine, and I called for a stretcher, and he said, no, no, I'll get up. He didn't know his leg was missing, and that's kind of stuck with me. Didn't know yeah. he lost his left leg. Yeah. That and traumatic that, amputation, I guess, like... The shock stopped the pain, more or less. The pain comes <coughs> later, maybe four or five minutes. <coughs> right. But I gave him a shot of morphine to ease the pain, put him on a stretcher. We had to carry him a mile back to the camp. He survived. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. That's good. The first night that I was there, I got in the hole with the gunnery sergeant who had been on Guadalcanal. And he said, you grab him, pull him in, and I'll stick him and make sure you throw him out. We can't fill the hole up. And I, I couldn't believe what he said. And as the night wore on, this happened. And the next morning, what, what we saw, I shook like a, like a dog on a barbed wire fence, and I was so scared. But when it happened, I wasn't scared at all. I guess the adrenaline had gone so much, and I never forgot that. So it was, this was like a century attack, or it was like a night attack? The Chinese were coming up the hill, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and they just kept coming and coming and coming. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, just grab them. I'll stick them, and you throw them. And, and I, how many times did you do that that night? I guess it was 25, 30 of them laying out there in the morning. <clears throat> and I got sick. I really, I, I got sick from fear. I didn't, when, when it happens, you don't realize it. But when it's all over and things quiet down and, and, and daylight comes, and you see what you've done. Holy cow, you know? I just couldn't believe what we did, and it, and it really affected me. It really did. Yes, sir. The luck of the draw, I've never lost sight of that. Fate and luck. I trained with 200 <coughs> men, arrived overseas. I never saw any of them in. No one <coughs> puts you where they need you. All went in different directions. About four years ago, I found, located one of my guys that I trained with. And he was on Pork Chop Hill, mm -hmm. and it made a terrible face. Saw so such combat. All the stories he told me. Mm -hmm. He went one way, I went another. Just this element of luck is incredible. Yes, sir. I never lost sight of that. Well, I had, I guess, the first two uh, North Koreans I seen. They stood up in front of me about 15 yards, looked, dropped their weapons, and turned around. Mm -hmm. I could have been had. I had two friends. The guy with me on, on, the, on the machine gun, I put on that before I left. I come home, I got a phone call that either he was dead or he was captured, his mother and father from Battle City. Mm -hmm. And by luck, he was captured, made it back even from Lakewood. Mm -hmm. I was looking through a book, and they had this guy in there, a master sergeant. Uh, <coughs> I turned around, I called the number, I said, you stay in, you were a master. Did you stop right here? Okay. I'm going to pick up right there. That man needs a little water. Okay, okay. <coughs> Put a little vodka in it. <coughs> I'm sorry. Go. Go.
What you're going to have to do yeah. is just put some back up, there. and then we start the Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate okay, it. Okay, we'll start with Mr. Adolph. You're doing great. You're doing very, very good. You know, we're good? Yes, sir. Absolutely. We're good. You guys are doing well. <clears throat> A little bit more interaction among yourselves, but this is doing good. And then, you know, you're going to get hit with your friend, Mr. Pope, right? Sorry. Well, I wanted to talk about this crazy offensive that Ike talked about. Okay. Well, stand by, stand by just one second. Stand by for a Ike, do you want to hold on to that, or do you want to just hand it back to me? If you don't mind, I can I just sit it down. Does anyone else need anything, right water or anything, before we go on? This is going very well. We're going to pick up again with Mr. Adolph, then we're going to go to Mr. Junta. Okay. All right. Tell me when I can go. We'll roll oh, man. Okay, Mr. Uh, I was reading the book, and Vincent was in there. His phone number was in there. I called him up. I said, look, you stayed in. I may as well he was captured in 51, so both of them were captured in 51, and both of them made it down. Now, was that the prisoner exchange after the war in 53? That was after the war. The one was during the war. Mm -hmm. The one uh, funny from North Jersey. The other one was about five years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, did you talk to him after? Did he report any abuse or anything? Well, we talked a little bit on the phone, and, and uh, mm -hmm. I didn't ask him any of the questions, what it was like over there. <coughs> it's family stuff. Right. And that was, uh, uh, before I get to Mr. Junta, from what, I mean, I don't want to jump to the end of the war, but one of the things that held up the war for so long was the talking about the prisoner exchanges, right? Yeah. Many of the North Koreans and Chinese didn't want to go back. Right. No. And, and the thing that always bothered me, and I remember teaching about this, was people were dying fighting about, like, while we were talking about how to get the prisoners back to each other. Yeah. And guys just kept on fighting. Yeah. Mr. Junta? Well, I don't know if anybody mentioned this, but the spring offensive, the Chinese would throw all civilians in the front. And one thing I really felt bad about, we had to shoot these civilians before yeah. soldiers were back. Yeah. The Chinese were all coming. Remember that? Waste your ammunition. Yeah. yeah. That's what it was. <laughs> what I couldn't get over, we saved the Chinese butts in World War II. Now they're trying to kill us. Yeah. I could never figure that out. If it wasn't for us, they would speak in Japanese. Right, yeah. And, well, and, uh, you know, yeah. and all of a sudden they're trying to kill us. A lot of them didn't really want to be there. They, didn't, they were just pawns in a game. Uh -huh. In fact, really? many of the Chinese didn't know they were in Korea, right? They, yeah. they, they yeah. thought they were still in China. But they knew how to kill us. Yeah. yeah well, they yes, were po poorly clothed, very poorly clothed. I could tell you a story about that. The Chinese were poorly clothed. Oh, yeah. 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 We, okay. uh, we may be able to get back to that. Okay. Yes, Mr. Regarding the peace talks. <clears throat> During those two years of the peace talks, 20,000 Americans were killed in combat. Right. As the war approached that signing of the, of the ceasefire, Sigmund Rhee did not <coughs> want that war to stop. He wanted us to move back into North Korea and that unify, which was impossible. So he managed to free hundreds of prisoners from prison camps. Mm -hmm. When I first arrived in Korea at night by truck, I was landed in prison camp number nine where the prisoners had just escaped. I was issued a weapon, a wooden bunk, and some supplies, and I didn't know what my uh, future was going to be at that point in time. But that now, was, was it after that they decided to keep those prisoners on an island? Was it Wamido. Seizure Island? No. Not Wamido, Seizure. No, it, it was uh, the south part. South, oh, Chichido. yeah. That was different. Chichido. Chichido. Chichido, yeah. Chichido. That was different. Yeah. They were contained, but there were prison camps. Of, scattered around. This is in the mountains uh, somewhere north of Busan. And uh, he emptied the prison camp. This isolated prison camp. So I, that's where I was. I guess uh, I guess Korea was one of the first where politics started getting in the way of the war. I mean, prior to that, we didn't have as much of that. But Korea sort of brought in the politics a little bit. There. It did, yeah. Um, I read the book, The Coldest Winter, and um, we were talking before. And um, as a historian, one of the most overlooked people in American history is Walton Walker. Yeah, general. Um, and and um, would anyone care to address or back me up on that uh, about uh, him and his part in, in the Korean War? Well, as you are aware, he was a hero of World War II. He was one of Patton's top tank commanders. Right. And he, he was uh, <coughs> thrust in when the North Koreans were pushing us down Dunkirk like he almost had to evacuate South Korea. <coughs> he issued the command stand or die. You probably are aware of that. Yes, sir. So he was he was a great, great leader there. Uh, yeah. No Anybody question. else want to weigh in on that? Walton Walker? 
Uh, then the other side of that would have been um, the role of MacArthur in this war. And yeah. what do you think about MacArthur? He was, How much time do I have? <laughs> yeah. In, in a nutshell, he was all right up to a point. And after that, I think his ego got the best of him. And we could have gotten an awful lot of trouble. He so, wanted to go all the way up into China. Yeah, he wanted to bomb the, the yeah. atomic bomb. Yeah, now okay. basically after the invasion of Inchon, he sort of, you know, took a little bit, you know, he push up to the he, north. He, well, he, yeah. was, he was That's a why hero. Truman went over to, to put the kibosh to it. <coughs> he was considered a hero at the landing of Inchon, which they didn't think they could make it. Mm. It wasn't for the Inchon, they went, went up to the Island River. Mm. And of course he wanted to drop the atomic bomb on China, and that kind of got him in trouble. Right, yeah. Yeah. So you agreed with the firing of? Uh, oh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All five of you? Yes. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Well, yeah. Walker, as far as I was concerned, yeah. Walker showed him up. Yeah. Walker showed him up when he saved boots on. Mm -hmm. I, uh, may I elaborate on sure, Walker? Sure, sir. Inchon yeah. was one of the most brilliant tactics ever achieved. Right. After that, the worst military tactics ever right. in military history was MacArthur's fault. Yeah. He drove. There was a huge mountain range in the center, mm -hmm. and he sent the second division, the 25th division, mm -hmm. the rock division on one side, and the first seventh marine division, the first marine on the other side, and they couldn't support each other. Right. Well, going up north, the actual geography of Korea goes like this, mm -hmm. and the gaps between the, the yeah. units were very big. And they could not support yeah. each other. He also right. said the Chinese would never get yeah, in. Right, and they came across in big numbers. Yeah, they, they, Boy, uh, did they ever. They weren't ready for the Chinese to come in. They didn't think they would come in. Now, by the time most of you fellows were in there, okay, the North Korean influence had been mitigated, but more and more the Chinese were taking control of the war. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Right. Anything about the styles of fighting between the North Koreans and Chinese, or what was it like? come up across the Chinese like they were erratic I mean, yeah. they had no value of life <coughs> I mean they would uh, charge a machine gun <coughs> think nothing of it. it felt like they were on drugs mm -hmm. and then one guy would carry a rifle two guys were behind without a rifle they would pick up the rifle that the guy just got whacked yeah and I had uh, heard stories about that where the one guy would have the rifle the yeah. other guy would have the ammunition right yeah, yeah. they uh, wouldn't fight unless the odds are at least 20 to 30 to 1 yeah the other thing with that is most of the Chinese were all carrying burp guns. Those, yeah, those Russian they were ready Russian to throw the moose right at that control out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, North Koreans didn't have, didn't have the people. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Chinese didn't care who got killed, well, yeah. they keep yeah. moving. Right. Yeah. 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 They killed their own, they killed their own civilians. Right. I yeah. guess there was a lot of civilian... Um, uh, South Korean. South Korean, yeah. yeah. Oh, God, the, the, yeah. the Chinese were better dressed, better outfitted than the North Koreans. And by the way, we treated the enemy that was wounded, just like we treat our own. I was going to get to that, and I didn't know how quite to bring that yeah, up. Uh, so your treatment of an enemy soldier was... Just like he was a human being, where they shot our wounded, we took... Well, he came last, you know, we treated our wounded first. Yeah. And then we got done treating our wounded, we treated the enemy. Because he was a human being, he wasn't an enemy no more. But they didn't treat us like we treated them. That was and, uh, and yeah. I guess years later, how does that make you feel? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, it made me feel like I was, uh, I don't know, be truthful. Uh, mm -hmm. after, I, after I heard Thank the things you. they did, I was sorry that I treated them. One thing, you didn't want to be captured. That was the main thing. Is that, no. was that the, the, that the, the saying amongst the Did you the see guys. evidences of... Um, uh, of uh, soldiers that were executed by the Chinese or Koreans? Did you see evidence it was of that? The North Koreans did the executing. Yeah, they, they, they put a yeah. bullet right in their head of your capture. Yeah. Wire your hands behind your back and they shoot them. That's what they were doing. And you came across things like that nature? No. I never did. Mr. Yeah. Gentle did, yeah. Um, I heard Mr. About Gentle, you all uh, tell the story about the um, your loader on a machine gun 30 cal. You have the person who the traverses it. Yeah. Assistant. Assistant gunner. And, uh, the interesting thing, and I'd like you to tell that story, is that you did visit his family years later. Mm. Can you tell the circumstances of how he died and then we'll visit the family? Well, As he's my, talking, think about a story like that you may want to hear. My company mm -hmm. is over there. It's a job Hogan and I were in the Tom Soul. I was the gunner, he was assistant gunner. So I don't know, all of a sudden, the missile, my DT2 says the missile but was a hand grenade. Him in the hole. He took most of the blunt. 
long enough to do so. I was a little lucky. And the helicopter came in. Mm -hmm. and helicopter took me back to the field hospital like MASH. I was still out. I could hear the helicopter rotor ringing even though I was out. I landed in the MASH hospital. I could feel them working on me. I could feel them working on me. And a few days later, they flew me back to Japan and I was in the hospital in Japan in Osaka. Now, is that when they sent you home or did they send you back to Korea? They never went back to Korea. No, that was it. Now, you visited his home, didn't you? Didn't you visit his family? That was after the war. About what year? <coughs> 1952. And what was South that like? South Carolina. Mm -hmm. His name was John Fogue, mm -hmm. African American family. Right. That was the fact. That was the first war where they integrated. Right. Mm. The African Truman mm. did that, and we only had one. Ranger did that. Like in my company, that was then John Fogue. Okay. Um, we're going to cut it off here. Um, we're going to take a break, and um, you need to then just think about what you want me to do when we come back. Okay. We're going to take yeah. about five minute break, get some water, relax, right. and give me some feedback on how this went, okay? How we're doing. Don't water. Okay. Thank you. Hey, put a, put a little.